Hello, I'm Leslie Friday and welcome to a Partners in Health uh, webinar. And this one is called Bending the Arc Towards Truth, Equality and Change. I want to give a couple seconds here for everyone who is dialing in. I know there were a number of people who are very interested in uh, listening in today. We have a star-studded cast of PIHers and I will introduce everyone in uh, just a, a second. Um, but you'll see that there is a uh, chat fu function at the bottom. So if you have any difficulty, we have a team in the back here and uh, they will help you get connected. So just feel free to chat. There will be no questions uh, from the audience. I will be asking questions of our panelists and um, very excited to begin. So thanks again to everyone who's participating. Thanks to uh, everyone calling in. Um, Again, we will have a recording of this available. If you know anyone who was interested in seeing this but uh, could not make it, they can access the full video later. So uh, I want to welcome each of our guests here. And first off, uh, Dr. Jim Young Kim, uh, co-founder of Partners in Health, vice president and partner at Global Infrastructure Partners and former president of the World Bank. Welcome, Jim. Uh, we also have Dr. Joya Mukherjee, our chief medical officer, of Partners in Health since uh, 2000. Welcome, Joya. Uh, we have Ophelia Dahl. She's our co-founder as well of Partners in Health, led PIH as executive director for 16 years and now chairs the board of directors. Welcome, Ophelia. Uh, as well, we have Dr. Paul Farmer. Uh, hello, Paul. Another co-founder of Partners in Health and chief strategist at PIH. Uh, and Dr. Sheila Davis. Hi, Sheila. Uh, Sheila is our Chief Executive Officer and uh, has, has been with PH for many years as Chief of Clinical Operations, Chief of Ebola Response, and our Chief Nursing Officer. So welcome, Sheila. And Todd McCormick, last but not least, uh, also a co-founder of Partners in Health. He now serves on the Board of Directors and on the Board of Trustees. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Leslie Friday, and uh, I'm your Director of Content here at PIH. So um, very honored to speak with all of you today. And uh, first question I'd like to uh, throw, I think, to you, Paul, and then I'd like to have a conversation among all of us here. Um, but the, the film Bending the Arc, which is available now on Netflix, so please visit um, if you have a subscription and, and stream it now. Uh, the film touches on some of PIH's founding principles. How have those held up? especially over the past nine months uh, in particular, and how would you rank progress toward them? Paul, go ahead. Thank, thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Chief Content Officer. <laughs> um, that's the coolest title. I don't uh, know what you mean, Paul, let me know, but go ahead. <laughs> I, um, you know, it, it's, it's um, since I'm with three of my uh, friends who were there in the 80s, um, and worked on on this sort of mission statement together. Um, you know, it, it was very influenced. Let me put it this way: by Latin America. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, I think of Haiti as part of Latin America. Certainly, Peru. Uh, but it, you know, this idea of preferential option for the poor, you know, was really cribbed from liberation theology, which has the deepest roots in in South America and Central America. And it wasn't entirely clear that that would be resonant, let's say, you know, on, on other continents. There were reasons that it would be troubling. Uh, you know, if you look at the North-South divide, there were reasons we knew that it would be troubling, you know, as a, as a radical commitment and radical in the sense of being really focused on the root causes of the problem as well as attending to those problems. So I don't think that we uh, believed when in the 80s we were writing these documents and working together on this you know, you know, this means of constituting partners in health, I don't think that we uh, assume that it would live on forever. And there have been uh, a number of our interlocutors and colleagues and friends who've said, well, you know, we don't really like this term, the poor. And again, this is a term is very common in Haiti and across Latin America to call oneself part of the poor or the people. And, um, and, and that said, you know, sometimes when we hear that, like our colleagues in Navajo said, you know, we don't really like that term. We don't think of ourselves as the poor. And why would you? You know, there are, um, and, and we've heard it elsewhere as well. But 
my take on that is, okay, well, we don't have to use that term. It, we, there are so many others. For example, when the Rwandans pursued a, you know, a really aggressive agenda to roll out services across the nation, they, they didn't use the term option for the poor. They talked about focusing on the bottom quintile, you know, which J Jim had to do when he was president of the World Bank. It's a different set of you know, uh, analytic terms and ways of describing something. But as, you know, Jim made very clear that, you know, he was sticking with option for the poor, even inside the bank. So I guess what I'm saying is, uh, I think these concepts have held up very well. We still have poverty in the world. We still have inequality. We still have racial injustice and plenty of it. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's pretty sturdy, but we shouldn't, we're not, it's not like religious orthodoxy from a church, right? That we, we should be open to shifting our language and our concepts over time. But I think they've held up pretty, pretty, pretty solidly. And I, I go back to Todd, Ophelia and Jim on that. Obviously Sheila is the main person since it's, you know, she's running the organization. Yes, and I, I wanted to, I guess, toss the baton over to Ophelia maybe next and, and around. Um, but Ophelia, did you have any other points to add uh, onto what Paula just said? Well, you know, one of the things that has made this, you know, th these founding principles and everything else that we, that we built Partners in Health on so um, rewarding is this, the, the fact that we're all still working together um, and that we have um, thousands and thousands of colleagues who, who, who have um, helped us um, broaden this message and indeed sort of push it forward. When you talk about the last nine months, you're, you're, you're absolutely right to focus on Sheila, Joya and others. Um, which is part of the the gratifying piece of this work is that is that so many have taken this on and now and now are creating strategy and and moving things forward. I, I agree completely with the over the P piece. I mean, um, option for the poor, as we um, as we say. I would also, you know, add the uh, the perhaps the obvious thing that that with that we generated um, the notion of uh, for us the notion uh, other people had it too of accompaniment. The idea that we would actually use um, the notion of proximity and having people from within the communities, the poorest communities, the most vulnerable people, that we would be working with um, with uh, accompaniateurs, and they they. they were, in fact, it's a very interesting thing if you think about the fact that the first time we started working with um, health agents or in Creole agents santé, and you know we were. A, medical, socio-medical organization, very small at the time, and the health agents themselves said to us, please don't call us health agents, call us um, accompaniators. We, would, we want to accompany those in these open-ended relationships um, along the way. And since then, and I would say this is the, the real answer to your question, how this is held up, is that we have broadened that notion um, almost uh, exponentially to mean the accompaniment of governments, uh, the accompaniment, the, the building of a community health worker force, which we see very, very strongly in, in epidemics and pandemics. Um, so, uh, you know, those, those principles feel very, uh, very real to us still and have held up well. Yeah, I, th I think of even right now in the United States, the idea of accompaniment, right, and how that's playing in. And maybe, Jim, if you wanted to, to add a bit onto the conversation here. Yeah, sure. You know, I, I think um, the, the commitment to this notion of a preferential option for the poor uh, took us down certain paths. And um, we learned so much from each path that we went down. So, you know, one of the first fights that we had with the global public health community was on drug resistant TB. And in that, we just saw things that we could hardly believe, you know, uh, people saying that um, it's actually fine and better and morally and ethically superior uh, to let poor people with drug resistant TB die because you're going to take money away uh, from the regular TB. I and mean, we, we could hardly believe that that's what we were hearing. But then that, that as the kind of, um, uh, the, a, a, as the result of taking an O for the P stance into things like global public health taught us so much, taught us about how uh, our uh, instincts and reaction has to be honed so that we're not talked out of O for the P by people who otherwise, you know, these are global health people. How, how is it that they're talking us out of treating poor people for something that's a deadly disease that's spread in an airborne fashion from one person to the next? And so then, you know, HIV after that, again, O for the P said, 
really? You're going to tell 25 million people in Africa that they're dead? I mean, literally, people said that. Uh, I think we're talking about the next generation, right? Literally saying you're all dead. And so um, I, I think that the idea was powerful, but it was powerful because we had, um, you know, the science and the gumption and the courage to tackle, you know, these arguments in front of people who part of their anger was they thought, how dare you question our ethics and our morals? And we said, we're not questioning you as human beings, we're questioning why you want 25 million Africans just to die, you know, and, and how, how is that possible? So I think with each victory like that, it's honed a kind of, um, a, a, you know, praxis, if you will, another term that, uh, uh, that Catholic uh, people love to, uh, to use, practice with reflection. And in this case, it's practice with reflection and with research and with evidence. And each time you have that next experience of saying, really? You're, you're going to tell me that all poor people are going to just die from this? Every time that that's happened, and there was a, there's a big chunk of time when I was off doing other things, you know, including at the World Bank. And what I found coming back was that those experiences have been repeated over and over and over again, so that the instincts of this team that Sheila now leads are, are really strong. And it's what led, especially Joya, uh, uh, and I was sort of behind Joya as she argued with experts who are saying, you know, there's no role for contact tracing. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it in the United States. Right. And I, I you know, we, we finally won that argument and everyone's talking about it. But now that there's the announcement of a vaccine, I feel like there's a real possibility of moving backwards and not doing those things that are going to be required to make sure that every poor person in the United States, every poor person in the world has access to that vaccine and to the benefits of, of, of science. So not only is it is it still relevant, but with each new experience that we tackle and each new um, uh, experience in which we see that oh, for the people puts us in such a good position vis-a-vis -vis, you know uh, what becomes the conventional wisdom uh, that I, I think this is an idea that that will um, um, I hope anyway outlive us as founders. And lastly, Todd, I want to I want to hand it over to you too, so you have an opportunity. You know, as, as someone who has been uh, with the organization since the early days, uh, what are you thinking now? It's been great to be watching the Ben in the Ark movie live for my last uh, uh, 30 plus years. Uh, and, you know, and it's interesting, at the end of that movie, they talk uh, a lot about how when Ebola was just hitting in West Africa and how the investments that have been made in Rwanda over a decade in combating AIDS and the spread of AIDS, how successful those efforts were in providing a public health infrastructure that uh, allowed them to effectively respond to Ebola. And you know, when I think about the last nine months, I was on a, a call, I know probably Sheila and Joy will reference them as well, but you know, our team in Rwanda now is the pride of all of us. Uh, I mean, they're, they're there and they're working. And I think as of 10 days ago, there were 37 deaths from COVID. And you, you compare and contrast that to some of the places, sadly, in our own country where we've not made some of these investments in public health and aren't having the infrastructure community health workers, it's, it's, it's discouraging. So it's, it's, it's really, you know, I think our, our principles are proving out once again that they're right principles. Uh, and it just, uh, I, I just wish that uh, these lessons that have been proven over and over again can start being adapted more readily uh, in more places. That's great, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. It's, uh, it's so fabulous to see the successes in Rwanda, right? And it's not magical thinking, it's actually good planning and, and execution um, of that plan. Uh, the next question uh, I think is really something um, that has been present on many people's minds for many decades, but is almost like an awakening for others. Um, it feels like the, the last social movement as powerful as Black Lives Matter was possibly the HIV movement. And, uh, and it's chronicled in Bending the Arc, right? So reminder, that is now available on Netflix uh, streaming, so please watch it. Um, do you see any similarities or their differences? And, this question I want to ask of Sheila and, and Joya um, as uh, two uh, really wonderful members who have been in the movement for HIV and AIDS since, since the 80s. So Sheila, maybe uh, do you mind taking that question first? Yeah, you know, there certainly are a lot of parallels in terms of, of movements being um, 
inspired and then being incorporated and changing so many different things. You know, if we look at what the HIV movement did in terms of, of really calling everyone to be such strong advocates, whether you're healthcare providers or in, in all the different realms, how, how critical and important that was and, and certainly how it is in uh, the Black Lives Movement as well. Also in terms of the opportunity for change, you know, how drugs were approved completely changed. The FDA and the whole clinical trials by a movement of people saying, this isn't fair, this isn't just, and we need to, uh, we as working with scientists, we as a group can, can change how major policies are. So I think that there's so many similarities of how HIV really uh, was able to bring together communities that were so marginalized and then bring them to the forefront. And I think the Black Lives Movement will, will propel us even further ahead and be a catalyst for change that we, that we desperately need. Great. Joya, did you want to add anything too? I'd love to, to hand the baton over your way. I would just say that, you know, apropos to what Jim and Paul and Ophelia and, and Todd said is, PIH is founded in racial justice. Um, and we, I, I think that's what's drawn me to PIH for all these years and has made me feel so zealot, <laughs> such a zealot about PIH because, you know, health justice must be racial justice, health justice must take into account the historic impoverishment of black communities around the world. And I think our rootedness in Haiti, which is the font of wisdom, in my opinion, around racial justice, um, the first country, of course, uh, founded by a slave revolution, and the presence of our, the, our Haitian team, our Haitian brothers and sisters kind of in our hearts all the time, who have worked so hard with their African brothers and sisters is a very moving transnational solidarity. And I, I, I would just say, and I want to keep this brief, that the thing that differentiated the AIDS movement from the lack of movement on TV for example, is that white people, like Eric Sawyer, who you see in the movie, were just disgusted by the lack of racial justice when it came to HIV medicines. And that extended, of course, to Africa. So uh, I think that it, it is a must that we make these really synergistic arguments. But I feel like PIH has been my home because of racial justice at the heart of it. I see several people nodding their heads and- You know, uh, not only, you know, just, just to elaborate what Joy has said, we have never, first of all, Haiti not only launched, you know, a nation state out of a slave revolt, really that was the end. It took a long time, it took many decades, but a lot of historians would argue that, that that's what led to the downfall of slavery elsewhere, uh, you know, within Britain and later its colonies, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we, uh, indeed, were very explicit around racial justice back in the 80s, but we've also had no experience in any of our expansions uh, elsewhere, particularly on the continent of Africa, but elsewhere across Latin America, and other places we work without our Haitian colleagues. And so I really want to say thank you, Joya, for just underlining that once again. And anybody else want to uh, add their perspective here? Uh, and just the topic or, or the relation, I guess, also between this current moment and what was uh, really a huge uh, moment in, in the 80s with HIV. Ophelia, did you want to add anything? Well, I mean, just it's, it's I think it's sort of been said, but it's worth underlining, which is that it's a coalition um, of groups. I think that once uh, we saw this with uh, HIV, as Paul said, we didn't see it so much with, with TB. We're seeing, and we had, um, you know, often unlikely partners that came together, um, uh, you know, from all different um, corners of the world, you know, high level politicians, a president, um, uh, the uh, activists of all different stripes. And, you know, there was a, a, a tipping point that happened. And I think that this, a similar thing has happened here. And I think that there's a broad group of people who say enough, enough, enough. And it's not going to be a you know, a, 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 a short-lived, short-memoried situation. We're gonna, we, we will, 
uh, it needs to be a, a structural change. And so there are, there are similarities without question. I just would add that I think, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement is, uh, just strikes me as being much more serious this time than the kind of versions of identity politics that I think, you know, we've avoided. Identity politics can, can be very important, but can also get really silly. And I think in this case, what we were talking about is real data. You know, if you combine option for the poor uh, with racial justice, um, it's very different than identity politics. And I, I think that's what's been encouraging to me about this. You know, uh, uh, black people are getting killed at just ridiculous, disgusting rates by police officers. This is real, you can't, you can't deny this. And, and I think that um, when you combine O for the P and racism and then bring these things together, it takes on a much deeper kind of, um, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, um, um, meaning and, and, and has more weight. And it's what I think we've tried to do all along, right? We've never been just about racial identity. We've never been just about healthcare. That bringing together of uh, these different kinds of analyses is actually really hard to do. Paul always talks about history and geography and political economy. To do all that is hard, but I think you are at risk of coming to some simplistic and uh, sometimes trivial conclusions if you don't do that. I, I hope that's what people you know, saw in the film, that we, we really took the time to not just do the work, but do the analysis in a way that uh, takes us away from just sort of simple-minded uh, truisms. I think that's a good segue yeah. to uh, for um, the next question. And, and, and also just to mention, I hope Paul, I don't embarrass you, but uh, Paul's book, Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds, Ebola and the Ravages of History is coming out November 17th and merges a lot of that conversation, right? History, geography, uh, racial justice or injustice really overlapping with global health. So uh, to look for that on November 17th. And if you haven't watched Bend in the Arc, please do so on Netflix. Our last question here um, is uh, meant, I hope, to be a, a great uh, general conversation here. Uh, PIH tends to take the long view. And uh, knowing that dismantling structural inequities requires courage, diligence, and really endurance. And I, I agree, it's part of what I love about Partners in Health. Uh, but this feels like a moment right for rapid change. Do you agree? And, and what about uh, now stands out to you? And if you don't mind, Jim, I'd love to go to you and maybe uh, Joya and open it up to other folks here. Well, uh, I, I think I think it's a it's a powerful moment, but it's also an extremely dangerous moment. I mean, the, you know, if you look at the um, uh, election in the United States, if you look at the rise of nationalism and, and frankly, racism, uh, nativism in so many parts of the world, I think it's a very dangerous time in the world, and so. Um, is it a time for rapid change? You know, gosh, I hope so. Uh, but I think, again, uh, we will be extremely well served by sticking with the things that we've learned over years at Partners in Health. And that is that, you know, if you, if you look at the world from the perspective of what does this mean for the health and well-being of the poorest? What, what, how, what does it mean for them? But I think it, it leads you to a lot of pretty clear answers. And, and in, the, in the case of, say, COVID in the United States, you know, what I'm watching for is whether um, uh, we revert once again to a kind of magical thinking that says that as long as we have treatments and as long as we have a vaccine, everything's going to be fine. Well, it's actually not, uh, it's already not fine for the people who are so-called essential workers. It's also already not fine for the people who are uh, from communities uh, that have been um, uh, marginalized for a long time and in which you, we see death rates that are far higher than the, than the community. So in order to get it right, you know, you're going to really have to build the ground game, build the kind of community health workers, the networks that, frankly, we've been building in, in, in Massachusetts under uh, Sheila and Joya's lead. And if we don't do that, we'll be making errors. And so I think in this case, uh, as we watch to see what kind of change really is afoot, if, if we stick with that insight of company tours, uh, focusing on how the poorest are doing in this epidemic, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, um, maybe unfortunately, we're going to run into some conflicts with people, you know, even in the new administration, uh, who are going to want to think that, you know, vaccines will solve all the problems. So this could be a time for change, but I, I think what we bring to the table in terms of option for the poor, the kind of justice work we've done, 
uh, is needed and I hope it's not ignored. Joya, what would you want to add uh, there? Yeah, I just, um, I, I agree with everything Jim said and I don't wanna uh, add too much just to say that um, in the middle of this terrible economic pain that people are suffering and the racial injustice and COVID, there is an intersectional possibility for for work that would be me that would change the material sort of lives of people. And I think that, you know, we talk about contact tracing, uh, but it isn't really what we're doing um, at Partners in Health. We are really trying to weed through the noise, find the most vulnerable, and make sure that those folks, you know, the poor, make that option for the poor real in an American system in the middle of a pandemic in, um, in this, you know, terrible economic crisis. So I think that I agree with Jim, it's very dangerous, you know, that people are becoming very unmoored and whatever, and this is why when people just talk about testing for COVID, they're missing the boat, right? Because you can test all day and we saw this with HIV, but if care and supporting people materially isn't central to what we do, the testing is, it, it completely makes no sense. So I, I, I'm hoping that we can, get those messages uh, to the government um, and help with that because I, you know, even if we had a vaccine tomorrow, there are communities all over the country that wouldn't even, they would be last in line. And, and so I just feel like the racial and economic justice aspects have to be fundamental to program design. Um, and it would be healing. It would be a way to heal the wounds. Um, you know, uh, uh, just one small anecdote. Uh, Paul and I were at a, at a, you know, like a little dinner in Rwanda in the very, very early days. We were in a village and there were some reporters that came with us. And there was a Rwandan doctor who has actually left the country and was not particularly O for the P and very kind of cynical and grumpy. And we were out in the community with community health workers and the reporter was there with us. And he asked, do you think this can work in Rwanda, these community health workers? I mean, people don't even like each other, you know, they're, it's post-conflict. And I thought, oh my God, he's asking this grumpy guy, like this is gonna be terrible. And this man, who was not really a PIH fanboy, said, this is exactly where you need community health workers. We need community health workers for healing, societal healing, people taking care of one another, people meeting each other's needs. And I, I think about that all the time, and I think about this terribly divided time in the U.S., wouldn't that be a way for people to reach across these ideologic divides around their common needs and suffering. Oh, well put, Joya, and, and um, whatever you call it, right? Expert mercy at this point with people who have deeply complicated lives. I, I will say, Leslie, to your question about, you know, the, the length of time this takes, it's sort of, there's an interesting tension between that because uh, early on, things that took us a long time to build systems. If you're really interested in building a system and you're not interested in just an intervention or, an, or you know, an in innovation, an app to do something, it generally takes longer. But the other good part of this story after these, uh, this amount of years is that what took us 20 years in Haiti took us five years to do with partnerships in, in, in Rwanda will take us probably you know, less time to see real progress made in, in West Africa. And it was because of this uh, experience and learning from our colleagues that Jim and Joya and Paul and Sheila were able to go to Governor Baker and say, hey, there's some piece of this missing that we've had in these other places and dealt with Ebola and other terrible epidemics uh, and, and HIV and all these other things. It's not only good for the epidemics, it's also good for the health system as a whole. So if you have built up that, that reputation, if you have experience doing it, then you can go and say, this is a rush. We are in a rush right now. There isn't a lot of time. We're not too late, as Jim says, but we are in a rush. 
it took it, uh, it took all of two weeks to stand up you know again i say that with awestruck admiration for my own colleagues but it it just you know, uh, you do learn how to do things and can speed it up very significantly, as Ophelia said. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to see more and more of that if we have the resources we need to do the work. You know, I have to say, I found that, you know, having been away from the organization in terms of a day-to-day -day level, I mean, you know, I was always in touch with the the the, um, uh, the, the founders and, and Joya and Sheila. I, I only met recently when I came back on the board, but... Um, uh, you know, in, is a great tribute to everyone else other than me on this call that um, you've trained this unbelievable group of people. You know, a lot of them very young, some of them not so young, um, uh, mostly younger than, than uh, Paul and Todd and me, but, but um, it's extraordinary because they, the way that they approach problems, you know, is just is so deeply embedded in the experience that we've had. You know, you start with O for the P, you get right to racial justice quickly. And then you walk into a room saying, there could be very credential people telling us that this is impossible or that you shouldn't do it. And don't believe them. Don't believe them because you know what? We've had this experience before. And, you know, now everyone will say that they were on our side, you know, 30 years ago, but they weren't. They weren't. And because that, those lessons have been so deeply you know, uh, taught in the group of young people. We see now people in Newark, people in Florida, people in Texas going in and able to influence the discussion in such important ways. I, I just, I, I, I can't tell you how impressed I've been with uh, just the quality of, uh, of, of, the, of the young people, uh, you know, who, who, um, uh, who are tackling, you know, this worst of all pandemics. You know, if I could just interject very briefly, and excuse me, uh, Todd, I don't want to cut you off, but one of the questions in the chat from Tawny, if I pronounced it correctly, um, is what is the plan of PIH for producing a lot of young, you know, young, this is just picking up Jim's point. We have, you know, we actually wrote that into the mission statement also, uh, that part of the job would be, we didn't use terms like local capacity building and, and wouldn't now either because it's kind of a goofy term. We met, I mean, it's just used so indiscriminately to dis describe all kinds of faux training programs that last, you know, a weekend in a hotel in a capital city somewhere. But in all of the places we work, we've launched formal training programs. In, in Haiti, uh, after the earthquake, when we were told this is not the time when we need to think about building an academic medical center. I mean, that's just a, amazing to me that right after the destruction of all the academic medical centers in Haiti on one day, that you would waste your breath saying, this is not the time. And now these programs are the largest ones training Haitian health professionals, nurses, physicians, managers. And in, in, in Rwanda, so taken were we by our commitment to the education part and the next generation part that we founded a university. And it's called the University of Global Health Equity. And, and I hope some of those listening will support it, visit it, be part of it, teach at it, learn in it. I know that we are counting on it. Sorry, um, Leslie, to just wanted to pick up on the chat question and Jim's comment about young people. And don't the pipeline of, uh, of young folks coming out of Cabra High who are watching. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> saw that comment come through this too. This is why we teach. This is why we, this is why we teach. You know, the Cabra High folks visited me at the World Bank President's Office every year. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the, that was uh, that was always great and so i want to say hi to all my friends there hey matt hey kid carbo hit kids from carboro <laughs> and sheila your your name has been mentioned so much and all of this and it's really been a whirlwind right uh, so i i would love for you to reflect too on this is it time for rapid change or or uh do we need to pump the brakes what's your perspective yeah, you know, I think the when many things that Paul say, say really resonate, but one about the cost of inaction. And I think, you know, there's one thing that I was so proud of, of what we did in Massachusetts and then in, you know, 10 or 12 other places in the U.S. is not wait for a perfect plan, but jump in. You know, we learn from our colleagues in Haiti again on, on with cholera on how to do contact tracing. Same thing with Ebola the book in West Africa. And I think that's, hopefully this will be an inflection point in the U.S. in our, our healthcare system that we focus in the community, we focus on public health, and we learn from 
our colleagues in other places in the world that do that part of a comprehensive model really well. We do hospitals really, really well. We don't do other things as well. And so how can we be humble as a country and say, yeah, like we need to learn, we need to help you in Sierra Leone get an ICU, but you know what, help us figure out how to utilize community health workers. And I think it's an opportunity and, you know, the bending the arc was about, you know, not giving up listening to those who are most proximal to, to what's happening. And this is a time when we can do that. It's an exciting time and, and a time when all movements, whether it's racial justice, climate justice, um, you know, all need to come together to, to try to give voice to people or give people the mic of uh, who are battling these things closest. So I think I'm optimistic. And I think it's a time that we need to really move. That doesn't mean we don't you know, continue to build roots and have a grassroots organization, but we have to do both at the same time. Yeah, I think that's the thing that's really phenomenal, right? Is that Partners in Health didn't stop working in 11 countries around the world. Uh, we continued doing that in addition to responding to a pandemic and working in the United States. It's really quite a testament. And Ophelia, I see you nodding so i just well, I, I i want to jump in with something because it occurs to me listening I, I i i listen to my my colleagues and friends and i'm i'm you know re-inspired and reminded of things and when i think about the, the the nature of this work and the founding principles although it's not written down as a principle i would say the aspirational quality of what it is that we set out to do remains strong today and it doesn't matter where we've all gone to work um, and brought the lens of, um, you know, option for the poor to whatever it is we do. And when I think even about, I was, I was just reminded of when Jim went to the WHO, um, you know, early 2000s and, and HIV was raging. And that aspirational quality, he came up with uh, the idea of three by five, three million people on treatment by 2005. And he got damn close with his big team and it was aspirational. But I can't tell you how many people I heard say at the time, but you only got to 2,764,000 and whatever, because that's the nature of, of how people are. And I think that that could be said for today and we mustn't get dragged down in the magical thinking of that or indeed the idea that because it's not exact, we won't get there. We have to do what we need to do um, you know, to be able to get that. And, and, and you're right to mention um, money and the fact that we needed that to do it even before we could finish building hospitals. We made sure the rebar stuck out. We knew it needed to be better and bigger. And this is a case today where the right investments and the right aspirational, non-magical thinking will, um, will, will drive us to a real foundation of public health um, that we can learn, as Sheila says, from our colleagues and partners in other parts of the world. That's that's the way forward. You see why we like each other? This is great. When can we do this again? <laughs> I just to say, um, I just, I was reading the comments and Corey Stern, our great, great friend said, gosh, someone should make a movie about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did. She did. And thank you, Corey, because it took so much patience uh, to, to, to make Bending the Arc. I, I hope you all enjoy it. I just say one quick thing is that I, you know, I've participated a bit in the process of uh, selecting Sheila as a new CEO, and it was one of the best processes that I, I've ever been uh, a part of, and I've been a part of a lot of them. And I just, you know, want to say that uh, um, uh, the, you know, Partners in Health always needs more funding, and as a board member, I can say, you know, without any hesitation, that uh, this is a fantastic organization. It is much stronger than when I um, uh, left it as a as a as a, as a worker. And, um, you know, uh, Partners in Health deserves your very, very strong support. Sheila is just an outstanding leader. I mean, I've, I've been a student of leadership. I've led institutes. She's an outstanding leader. She knows how to get people involved. She knows how to take on, you know, the, 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 the public health denialists. Um, she's done the work herself. And, and the young people, I mean, I just, again, the people, some of them who've left PIH, to go do other things, and then we're brought back uh, to, to tackle COVID. Oh my goodness, just some of the most impressive people I've ever seen. And so uh, the world needs more of PIH. They need more of PIH influence everywhere. 
The United States probably needs it more than anywhere else right now, unfortunately. And uh, um, without the support of people on this call, um, uh, we won't be able to get there. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, There's a you. Sheila Luffest going on over in the chat room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give all of these comments and send them to you daily, Sheila. Sheila's <laughs> cup of tea, this kind yeah. of. Uh, <laughs> Pam S. said, uh, yeah, I like you guys too, but we said we actually love each other. <laughs> True that. Uh, I see you're unmuted too. I want to give you a chance to, to throw in uh, your two cents. Oh, sorry, Todd. Todd. Oh, sorry. No, the only two cents I'll throw in is I've been trying to, uh, you know, raise money and awareness for Partners in Health for a long time. Uh, I, I'm so glad Benny and the Ark is there because even if you can't give more money yourself, you can share that movie with friends and, and other people who have influence uh, uh, with others. But for me, the difference of trying to get people aware of a preferential option for the poor in Haiti 30 years ago is so much easier today because the, the, the Venn diagram is crossed over. The, the preferential option for the poor in the United States today has never been closer than the preferential option for the rich. You know, whether you're a small restaurant owner or a business owner or trying to run a convention uh, a business, if we can't invest in the poorest and to help the, the, the uh, public health infrastructure in our country, you know, we're not going to have our economy back. And I think the most amazing things about South Korea or Rwanda is their, their economies aren't going down anymore. They're going up. And, and this is the... Uh, uh, connection. So I think it's easier now as advocates and people that are trying to help us bring resources into this uh, 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 mission is to tell the story now because frankly a preferential option for the poor is best for everybody not just for the poor. Yeah absolutely. I, you know and as a as someone who's worked in now finance for the past decade or so um, the, there is an almost direct connection between the integrity uh, and, fun and the effectiveness of the on-the-ground public health response and economic growth. It's, all, it's, it's just as direct as it could be. The largest growing economies are China and then second is Korea, right? So it's directly connected. And this is just such a huge misunderstanding. And in this case, it's never been more clear. If you have accompaniment, if you have a focus on the poorest, if you set up systems that, that, that ensures that everyone can be tested, can be the beneficiary of contact tracing, can be supported in isolation and quarantine and then treated, if you've got all those things in place, that's when the economy will come back. And I just, I, I don't understand uh, why this has not uh, entered the consciousness of, uh, of leaders in the United States. And so, you know, um, this is the message we're carrying. It's a very direct uh, economic message. And Paul or Joy, I see you're unmuted too. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to add any other comments yeah i don't want to have the last word so i i do want to say something but i hope paul will follow me uh i i just think you know we're joking and saying a lot about love it comes up a lot in the movie and we feel it every day and i think what's really been hard to watch in this country is the level of nihilism and you know We've called, you know, Paul sometimes calls it containment nihilism, I've called it public health nihilism, but just the, the disregard whether people live or die is really sad. And really, we can't build a, a society based on that disregard. And I think that, to me, is what we need with this response is really to root it in love and compassion and bring ourselves, you know, and our country around to that instead of this very kind of cruel nihilism, uh, whether it's against, you know, people of color or the elderly in nursing homes. Uh, every life matters. Every life is fundamentally infinitely worthwhile. And so I, I just think that's, that's where we see the path forward with this pandemic. Um, and that's where we see the path forward with the, you know, the anti-racist work as well. Yes, and, and Paul, on that note, do you want the final words there? Well, I mean, I hate to take the final word, and I know it won't be final for the reasons that we said, that there are so many young people taking up this work. But, you know, um, 
when we hear and we see in print or hear in meetings, you know, people say, well, you know, this is not, it's, you know, take something like cancer care uh, in, in, you know, Rwanda, let's say, you know, when we hear people say, well, you know, or the hospital that I just mentioned in Haiti, after Haiti's hospitals were destroyed, the teaching hospital, to hear someone say, this is not the time to worry about, and then fill in the blank. As Ophelia says in Bending the Ark, you know, surely you can't be thinking about this when you should be thinking about that, as if we were, incap we were incapable of addressing multiple problems at the same time. Um, there is a sadness there, as Joy just said. But we also believe, at least, you know, I, I think the people on this call believe that if you have proximity to that kind of suffering, if they were your family members, for example, you'd never hear that. You know, if, if, if your, you know, daughter is, you know, is dying of leukemia and you're, you know, rural Rwandan mom, you're not going to say, oh, you know, I'm sorry, it, she's Rwandan, my daughter. She's not sustainable, cost effective. It's not feasible. It's not, you know, it's just, we don't believe people would say that if they had more proximity. And since, you know, the people who run Partners in Health Rwanda are Rwandan, you know, it's not the kind of platform where you could bring you know thousands and thousands of, uh, of people into proximity and i'm sure that if you're working in harlem or in uh, you know immokalee florida or in newark new jersey you know you see people from outside your everyday experience casting aspersions on you saying you don't matter saying your lives matter less less this is the root of everything that's wrong with the world the idea that some people some lives matter less than others so fighting that uh, requires persistence. Certainly it requires friendships, as you've seen, and networks, you know, but it also probably requires some proximity. And, and that's one of the reasons we want to say thank you to Corey Stern, you know, to Keith, Pedro, and others who made this movie is, you know, very vivid, much more so than a, you know, a book or something or an article in a medical journal. So we got to fight together and, uh, and maintain that optimism that people's hearts can be changed. Really fantastic. Thank you to everyone here. I really appreciate this conversation and hope that someday we'll be able to do it in person. Um, uh, but there's much work to be done until then. Uh, so one, one last mention, Paul's book, if you didn't want the last word right here, his book is out on November 17th, Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds. So definitely check that out. And if you haven't seen Bending the Ark or you want to watch it again because it is fantastic, please check it out on Netflix. And uh, lastly, as Jim said, please donate. Uh, if you can, uh, donate uh, and you, you can go to PIH.org. You'll easily find a, a button there that's bright and orange um, to support the wonderful work and share Bending the Ark. If you aren't able to donate, please do share news of it with your friends. So with that, thank you very much. I look forward to the next conversation with all of you. And uh, thanks to all of our listeners out there. Have a thank great you, Leslie. Thank thanks, you. Leslie. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye.